On April 3rd, 2007, Kyle Vogt tweeted, hacking away on video code. No one knew it at the time, but Kyle had just started building the live streaming service that would eventually become Twitch. Every overnight success actually has a 10 year journey behind it. Well, it's been over a decade since Kyle became an entrepreneur, and he's now raised $10 billion to build a fleet of driverless taxis at his latest company, Cruise. The story of how Kyle went from dropping out of MIT to co-founding Twitch, and then to working on self-driving cars is a classic example of grit and determination paying off in a big way after years of sleepless nights. And it all starts with a locked safe in the basement of his university dorm. Kyle had grown up in a suburban part of Kansas and had always been passionate about robotics. So when he got the chance to go and study computer science and electrical engineering at MIT, he jumped at the opportunity. While at MIT, Kyle was constantly solving robotics challenges. He interned at iRobot, the company that makes the Roomba vacuum cleaner. He competed in a self-driving car competition that essentially spawned the entire autonomous vehicle industry. And even before college, he had built robots to compete in two separate BattleBots events at just 13 years old. So when his friend discovered a locked safe in a dusty basement on the MIT campus, Kyle knew that they had to build a robot to crack it open. Now, most people would just go get a blowtorch or maybe just ignore the safe entirely. But Kyle is a true engineer and wanted a challenge. It was the middle of winter and a particularly harsh Boston snowstorm had blanketed the campus. There wasn't much going on outside, so Kyle and his friend spent weeks building a device to open the safe. They settled on an auto dialer, which would brute force the combination by entering every possible number one at a time. The device was clunky and needed huge magnets to attach to the front of the safe, but it worked. The auto dialer iterated through hundreds of combinations before finally hitting the correct sequence of numbers. The safe swung open and Kyle was finally able to claim his prize. But before we talk about what was in the safe, we need to address another key moment in Kyle's time at MIT. During Kyle's junior year, he started talking with a Silicon Valley entrepreneur named Justin Kahn. Justin had already sold one tech company and was looking for engineers to help him with a new project. The idea was to build a website that would host a live stream of Justin's life, and this project would eventually become Twitch. Kyle had no way to predict how big of a success Twitch would be, but he had four weeks of free time coming up during MIT's regularly scheduled independent activities period. Taking a break from school to go build some interesting technology with experienced Silicon Valley entrepreneurs seemed like a low risk bet. So Kyle signed on. He immediately fell in love with the technical challenges in front of him. So he deferred his enrollment at MIT and started building the future of live streaming full time. These days, every social media platform has a live streaming option. But back then, serving real time video over the internet required cutting edge skills. As the product evolved from Justin's individual stream to community streams, and then eventually to gaming streams, Kyle was focused on scaling the underlying technology. And you can see how hard he was working from his tweets during this period of time. In April of 2009, he improved site performance by 57% with a new database tool. Then just five months later, he was struggling with more scaling issues. Basically, whenever the team ran into a difficult technical issue, Kyle would step up and do whatever it took to fix the problem. It was a period of probably 18 months where I had normalized going to bed and then like waking up at 4 a.m. whenever like the traffic would spike in, in Europe mm -hmm. and like spend an hour and a half to two hours battling server fires and then like pass out. That was like every single day, seven days a week for like 18 months. It was clearly hard work, but it wound up paying off massively. Twitch ultimately sold to Amazon for nearly a billion dollars and Kyle had proven himself not only as an engineer, but also as an entrepreneur. There was a problem though. Kyle had made a lot of money, but that was never his primary motivation. He was obsessed with solving engineering challenges. Remember, this is a guy who spent three weeks cracking a safe when he had no idea what was inside of it. He wasn't interested in just collecting a big check from Jeff Bezos and then sitting on a beach somewhere. He was on the hunt for his next safe to crack. Twitch might have felt like an overnight success from the outside, but Kyle had spent years working tirelessly to make live streaming a reality. He had learned that startups are marathons, not sprints. So he decided on three key criteria that he would use to decide what to work on next. I wanted to use you know, the skills I had as an engineer and developed uh, to do something good. The second one is it had to have extremely hard technical problems that need to be solved, because I know that's what engages me and keeps me motivated. And the third one is it had to be a good business, because to <laughs> actually achieve that positive social impact, you need scale. Self-driving technology was a perfect fit because it satisfied all three of Kyle's rules. It could save lives by reducing car accidents, it required cutting edge engineering to work and had the potential to impact the entire transportation market. The only problem was, 
Everyone thought it would be impossible for a startup to build a self-driving car. It was clearly an incredibly expensive endeavor, and Google was already years ahead. If Kyle was going to build a self-driving car company, it would mean staking his entire reputation on the project. He had built up enough credibility to raise money for basically any idea he wanted, so he decided to cash it all in at once and shoot for the moon. Kyle had decided to take on one of the biggest tech companies in the world, and he knew he couldn't do it alone, so he started assembling his team. First, he joined up with Daniel Kahn, Justin Kahn's brother, to co-found the business. Then, he joined Y Combinator and started really building the company, which the team was now calling Cruise. At the time, Y Combinator wasn't really known as a place to go and build hardware startups. Airbnb and Dropbox were the most high-profile alumni companies, but things were about to change. One YC founder named Oliver Cameron had started working at Udacity and was rolling out a self-driving car class that would be open to anyone with an internet connection. All of a sudden, engineers from all over the world were starting to build their own autonomous vehicles. This educational program was really transformative for the industry. People were realizing that building a self-driving car was inevitable, and engineers were starting to learn the necessary skills to join the new industry. Google had already hired most of the self-driving car experts, so Kyle and his team needed a way to differentiate. They knew that it would be impossible to go head-to-head -head with Google and build a fully autonomous car immediately. So they settled on a hybrid approach. While it was certainly impressive to demonstrate a Google car that didn't even have a steering wheel, that project was taking too long to get to market. Every year, there would be tons of articles about how the Google self-driving car was right around the corner, and then every year it would fail to ship. Kyle and his team wanted to get something into the hands of consumers as soon as possible. So they settled on an aftermarket kit that could modify a car to add some self-driving functionality. The initial specifications were pretty narrow, it only worked on the Audi A4, and it could only help with highway driving, but it actually worked and people were eager to buy it. It was an important milestone for the company, and Kyle was able to take reporters for test rides in 2014. Cruise was still far from launching a commercially available self-driving car, but the fact that they had managed to launch the Highway Drive Assist product so quickly was incredibly promising. Investors started to think that Cruise really had a shot at beating Google, but soon it became clear that the Audi modification strategy needed a massive overhaul. See, strapping some cruise equipment to the top of an Audi made sense as a prototype, but there was just too much risk to this approach if Cruise started rolling it out to more car brands. When it comes to something that has safety critical implications like controlling the steering and you know, other control inputs on your car, it's pretty hard to get there with, with a retrofitter. There's basically an infinite list of long tail issues that can get you. And if you're dealing with a safety critical product, that's not really acceptable. So Kyle and his team at Cruise were going to have to figure out how to build their own self-driving cars from scratch. It was really the only way that the team could guarantee that critical systems would behave as expected. But building a new automotive company is far from easy. Only two major car companies have avoided bankruptcy in the history of the United States, Tesla and Ford. And these businesses are incredibly capital intensive. So the only option for Kyle was to find a company to partner with. Fortunately, General Motors had been looking for a way to position themselves in the self-driving car industry, and they weren't particularly interested in building a team from scratch. Partnership between GM and Cruise would solve problems for both companies. Kyle and the Cruise team would get access to the manufacturing plants needed to mass produce self-driving cars, and GM would be able to transfer the self-driving technology to their fleet. It seemed like a win-win. But this was a big moment for Kyle, since he had seen Twitch get absorbed into the Amazon corporate structure. Would he still be able to satisfy his life goals of working on something impactful, challenging, and scalable inside of a 100-year-old car company? Or would he burn out and leave as soon as his shares vested? It wasn't a decision to take lightly because starting from scratch at this point would be incredibly difficult. See, if GM acquired Cruise and then failed to really back the self-driving car project, all of Kyle's work would be for nothing. And leaving to start a new self-driving car company probably wouldn't be an option either because of all the legal red tape from the acquisition. But Kyle realized that GM needed Cruise as much as Cruise needed GM. So they struck a deal. In 2016, GM acquired Cruise for around a billion dollars. It was an incredible financial outcome for everyone involved, since the company was only a few years old. But for Kyle, it only raised the stakes further. He now had to deliver a fully self-driving car to the public, and he only had a few years to do it. 
Google was far from the only competitor at this point. Tesla was planning on adding self-driving functionality to all of their new models, and Uber had built an entire research team dedicated to autonomous vehicles. Smaller startups were starting to carve out niches in the industry too. Kama AI had doubled down on their own retrofit strategy, and Oliver Cameron, the YC alum who worked on the self-driving program at Udacity, wound up launching his own driverless car startup named Voyage. Oliver had been particularly focused on creating user-friendly ride-sharing services at Voyage and had rolled out self-driving cars in retirement communities. As competition heated up in the industry, the public started asking more questions about the long-term implications of this new technology. Specifically, one peculiar thought experiment began coming up again and again, the trolley problem. The problem usually goes something like this. Imagine that you're driving down a freeway in a self-driving car and you get boxed in on all sides by other vehicles. Then all of a sudden, something huge falls off the truck directly in front of you. There's no way that your car can stop in time to avoid hitting the object entirely, so the AI needs to make a decision. Do nothing and smash into the object, swerve left into an SUV, or swerve right into a motorcycle. Should the car prioritize your safety by hitting the motorcycle, minimize danger to others by not swerving, even if it means hitting the object from the truck and sacrificing your life, or take the middle ground by hitting the SUV, which has a high passenger safety rating? And the question is what should the self-driving car do in that situation? These ethical questions became incredibly popular, mostly because they're just so interesting to talk about, but they're built upon one common misconception about self-driving cars. When people think about autonomous vehicles, or really any robotic system, they tend to think that programmers are mapping out every single action as a set of rules, but that's actually not how it works. Here's how one of the cruise team members put it. Everyone talks about the trolley problem. That's the most asked question I get every time I do an interview. And I think it's a little silly because if you're ever in that position to begin with, something is wrong. It's certainly thought provoking to imagine a situation where an engineer has to write a specific rule in code to address the trolley problem. But in reality, the system is just going to be continuously trying to avoid avoid collisions of any kind. And the only reason these autonomous systems have begun to work as well as they have is because of a revolution in machine learning that removes the need for those types of hand-coded rules. This new machine learning creates new problems though. It requires an immense amount of data. That data really isn't too difficult to gather though. You can just attach equipment to cars and drive around gathering images of the city streets. The problem is labeling that data. The companies that exist today, if you're gonna to go to them and say, I want a million miles of driving, every, every bit of data from that drive annotated by humans, I think that would be billions of dollars. So Cruz came up with a few interesting solutions here. Kyle and his team created a system that auto labels the data by drawing connections between various images, maps, and other data sources. Solving the problem of data labeling at scale is hard work but it's exactly where Kyle thrives. And his team has made significant advances here, even creating an entire 3D city simulation to help generate extra driving scenarios for testing. Autonomous systems succeed or fail based on the data that they're given. So naturally, you'd think that more data is always better. But not everyone agrees with that. Kyle and his team added LiDAR sensors to cruise vehicles in order to feed their systems as much information as possible every second. But it was a controversial move. Now, to be clear, LiDAR is a well-established technology. When the SpaceX Dragon capsule is docking with the International Space Station, it's using a LiDAR system to detect the exact distance between the capsule and the station. It's an incredibly precise technology, and when you're building a million dollar rocket, you can afford to use the best sensors available. But Elon Musk has some strong opinions about using LiDAR in self-driving cars. LiDAR is, is a fool's errand, and, any, and anyone relying on LiDAR is doomed. That's a pretty aggressive condemnation of LiDAR, and people tend to pay attention when Elon makes a bold pronouncement like that. But it's important to unpack what he really means there. Elon made that comment during a Tesla event focused on self-driving technology and his argument against LiDAR was primarily focused on the cost of each unit. Individual LiDAR sensors can easily cost tens of thousands of dollars, so adding them to cars designed for everyday consumers just doesn't make economic sense. Elon had been working for over a decade now to drop the price of electric vehicles to a point where anyone can afford them. Adding expensive sensors to each car was fundamentally incompatible with his long-term plan, but Kyle saw things differently and had developed a unique strategy at Cruise. Kyle and his team had already seen prominent promising results from using LiDAR to detect objects around cruise vehicles, and they believed that the price of LiDAR would fall. So they acquired a company named Strobe to build the next generation of LiDAR sensors. The Strobe team had been 
working on collapsing the entire LiDAR sensor down into a single chip, which would dramatically reduce the cost of each unit. Second, and perhaps most importantly, Kyle had crafted a significantly different business model from Elon. Tesla was focused on building cars that could be sold directly to consumers, so they had to be affordable. Cruise, on the other hand, would focus on deploying self-driving cars through ride-sharing and delivery services. With this new strategy, Kyle and his team announced the Cruise Origin in January of 2020. It's not a product you buy, it's an experience you share. The Cruise Origin really made it clear to everyone in the industry that Kyle and Elon were taking two completely distinct paths to solve self-driving. This new vehicle from Cruise didn't even have a steering wheel and was designed to drive for 1 million miles. The goal was clear, create a driverless car that was entirely owned and operated by Cruise. Everyday commuters wouldn't even be able to buy this new car. So all of a sudden, the price per vehicle could be a lot higher and still make economic sense for Cruise. But even though Kyle didn't have plans to sell these vehicles directly to the public, he still had to design a product that consumers would love. At this point in time, lots of skeptics had written off self-driving cars as a fool's errand and claimed that true self-driving would never arrive. Pressure was building as more and more self-driving car companies started to miss their announced launch dates. And it didn't help that Kyle had previously stated that Cruise would launch in 2019. Cynical takes were pouring in left and right, and every day was critical now. Kyle had accomplished so much, but what would it take to finally get across the finish line? He'd built an incredible team, struck a critical partnership with GM, raised billions of dollars, and delivered a truly world-class self-driving experience. But actually releasing it to the public would require even more hard work and sleepless nights. Kyle wanted to deliver affordable and reliable ride-sharing using Cruise autonomous vehicles, and he needed to grow the team to do it. Fortunately, Oliver Cameron had been building this exact type of service for years now at Voyage. Now, Oliver had focused Voyage on servicing retirement communities specifically. And if Voyage could figure out how to let 80-year-old retirees use self-driving cars reliably, they could definitely figure out how to deliver a great product to San Franciscans. So Kyle acquired Oliver's company, Voyage, and gave him the title of VP of product. It was go time. Kyle had to deliver a polished product by the end of 2021, or else the entire project could start to lose steam. The team worked tirelessly, and on November 3rd, 2021, it finally happened about to do my first driverless ride ever in San Francisco. Kyle and his team had finally delivered. There was no safety driver ready to take over if something went wrong. There was no remote control of the vehicle from Cruise HQ, and they were driving in San Francisco, one of the most confusing cities in America, but it worked. <laughs> that was so smooth, so cool. It, it just worked, that was, uh, that was amazing. I don't know what to say. Thank you, Cruise. You guys made this happen. Now. Kyle's journey is clearly far from over, and Cruise has tons more milestones to hit before self-driving cars are truly ubiquitous. But I'm incredibly optimistic for one major reason, and it all comes back to that safe in the MIT basement. See, most people who set out to crack a safe do it for what's inside. They don't really care about how they got the safe open. All that matters is the reward. But that's just not how Kyle's brain works. He's focused on the journey and has an intrinsic love of problem solving. That's why when he mentioned the story of the MIT safe during an interview, he didn't even address what was inside the safe. The contents of the safe don't matter. What matters is the journey required to open the safe. In a few years, when we're all regularly riding in self-driving cars, I'm sure the experience's novelty will fade, but Kyle will be out there focused on an entirely new technical challenge, just enjoying the process of cracking the next safe. Thanks for watching this. If you're looking for another amazing story about an automotive entrepreneur, go check out this video where I explain why one of Tesla's co-founders quit the company to start a new startup.